My first guest tonight is Dr. Tony Rogers, a cardiothoracic surgeon with Baptist Health. Welcome. Thank you. Now I mentioned, uh, I mentioned aortic valve, but the heart has different valves. And maybe we ought to start out by kind of giving people an idea what is a valve. Well, there's four valves in the heart. Um, two of the primary ones we talk about are the aortic and the mitral valve. They're really paper thin uh, structures that direct the flow one way that makes the heart efficient. And sometimes those valve can get diseased. Correct. Uh, and, and usually uh, we see it more in the older patients, but they, they uh, really uh, cause great problems uh, for our health uh, once they do become diseased, that's for sure. Any other, uh, other than age, is there other risk factors? There's other risk factors such as uh, rheumatic fever, which uh, thank goodness you guys have taken a great uh, deal of uh, credit for resolving that. We don't see it very much. Occasionally we see it in people who've come from other countries. Um, uh, it used to be very common. The other, uh, we see it occasionally in radiation treated patients for malignancies also. How about congenital? Is people born with bad valves that need replacing? Well, they, they do, but it usually doesn't become a problem until they're older, and that's called the bicuspid valve. It's actually the second most common uh, cause for valve replacement in the aortic position today. A normal valve is, has three cusps. A bi bicuspid valve has two cusps. Now, so if somebody's got valve disease, are there some symptoms that you may think, uh, this might be related? You can have valvular disease and have no symptoms. But as it progresses, the symptoms start occurring, and that's when you need to be more concerned about that. Some of the first symptoms would be more fatigue, maybe perhaps shortness of breath with activities that you used to be able to do. As you get into a more advanced stage or severe aortic stenosis, you'd have uh, symptoms such as syncope or fainting, and uh, also uh, you can get chest pain or angina. Okay. Now, sometimes I'll pick up valve disease when we do a physical on somebody and we'll hear a murmur. But how do you make the diagnosis? I think you guys are really the, the first line and, and a stethoscope and a heart murmur is the way you make the initial diagnosis most commonly and it's confirmed with an echocardiogram. Uh, there's two different varieties, but we don't need to get into that today. But uh, a stethoscope and a primary care physician really is uh, paramount in picking it up early. So once you make the diagnosis, how do you make the decision to operate? And I use the term operate, that's not necessarily what you do anymore. Well, I think you guys follow the patients uh, for many years. When they start to become symptomatic, you follow them periodically with uh, uh, what we call echocardiograms. If it's mild, it might be over three to five years. If it's moderate, it might be over one to two years. And then when it comes to severe, perhaps uh, referral to a cardiologist would be entertained by, by you all. And when they end up with you, there's a new procedure called TAVR. Correct. It's been out about four or five years. We were the second hospital, Baptist Health, in the state to do the procedure. Tell me about it. It's an exciting procedure. It's been in Europe for several years. Uh, traditionally, the uh, way you replace the aortic valve is to basically split the sternum, called a median sternotomy incision. It's a big procedure. Many patients are candidates because of their frailty and other medical conditions. So the TAVR is a procedure that we do through the groin primarily these days, and, and it really doesn't even involve an incision in the majority of the patients. Pass it up to the groin into the heart. Correct. Through a catheter, we direct it into the heart. We do rapid ventricular pacing so the heart stays relatively stable, and then we deploy the valve. And it's a, uh, it's a bowel prosthesis similar to the bowel prosthesis that we have today that we've been doing for years. And now, who, who's a candidate for that? Used to, you said frail, but it's becoming more the accepted standard than not? Correct. Uh, when we first started doing it, it was only approved by CMS for uh, high-risk patients, and we did many patients in their 90s, uh, a lot of patients in their 80s with severe uh, medical illnesses such as COPD, uh, chronic kidney disorders, and we had amazingly good results. Um, and now the CMS has approved it for intermediate risk, and we hear rumors that maybe toward the end of the year it'll be approved for low-risk patients. It also has, I guess, the surgery itself less risky because you don't open the chest. Yes, I mean, uh, traditional aortic valve replacement is a good procedure, but the patient's debilitated. You have to be so strong um, to have the procedure done, and so many of the patients that need the procedure actually are not strong enough to do it. So that's where the TAVR originally came into play, and it's been a marvelous addition to our, our, our treatment uh, options. So instead of a long hospital stay with multiple complications, it's a pretty slick procedure. 
the complications have been amazingly small. I mean, the, the risk of stroke is um, maybe even be lower than the traditional approach. Um, and usually in the hospital, around three to four days, which is unbelievable. Some of these patients are, are, are very elderly, as I stated, and they're very sick, and that's, uh, it's really a miracle in some ways. It's great information. Thanks for coming in and sharing with us. Thank you.